Will Hickey talk about the golden hour? Thanks very much. You'd be glad to know I don't have any family videos and no thoughts on evolution. Um, but I am very pleased to be here and very thankful to the Road Safety Authority for their invitation to speak and offer the perspective uh, of the role of the emergency department in motor vehicle collisions. Uh, people call us casualty, they call us A&E, but our correct title for the last almost 11 years now has been the emergency department. I'm also very conscious of uh, the, the uh, personal stories told by the individuals um, over the course of today, which I think were very moving and powerful. Uh, and I appreciate that some of what I say is going to be uncomfortable from, for them and from their perspective. Um, but bear with me. So the objective of this session is to provide an emergency department's perspective on road trauma and also to explain the treatment priorities and rationale. And the golden hour concept will appear in this, but the, the situation is a lot broader than the golden hour uh, would indicate. So to start with an overview, this is the real world. This is a six kilometer stretch of road from, uh, from Castle Baldwin in South Sligo to Clunamahan. Uh, and you can see the picture on the, the lower left, and there are four crosses visible on that stretch of road. There are 27 crosses on that six kilometer stretch of the N4. Um, and older people in the community, this is the, the, the recorded deaths since deaths have been recorded, but older people in the community have been pointing out where older you know, people that, that they remember dying are not included in these statistics. So this is the real world. And these, and in, in my 16 years in Sligo, I've seen a lot of these people been brought either dead or been brought seriously injured and subsequently die uh, to Sligo General Hospital. And one of the issues for the emergency department is to be able to get the information about what happened. Um, so if you come from a scene like this and you'll notice that um, that car has collided with a pole but the, you can see one of the front wheels of the car is in the back seat. And that degree of deformation of a car is something that our colleagues in the emergency services can convey to us because when they bring in somebody that they've neatly packaged up, it can be quite difficult to appreciate the situation from which they've come. So when they come to our resource room, and it's currently empty for that photograph, um, they're packaged up and it can be very difficult to appreciate exactly uh, the situation from which they've come. There's lots of evidence um, and lots of reasons to be optimistic. There's international evidence that organized trauma care improves outcomes by 30%. There is no doubt that the management of major trauma, of which road trauma is a significant part, has improved significantly in the past 20 years. There have also been significant improvements in the ambulance service within the past 10 years, and you would have seen the Dublin Fire Brigade demonstration earlier on uh, which shows a lot of what they can do. Uh, but obviously, um, you know, that, that's continuing to evolve. There's also now more significant senior input into trauma care. In the past, if you were involved in, a, in an incident like this, you probably would have been brought in to a casualty department somewhere in the country with one junior doctor on duty, and that was it. Um, and your care might have been delivered, uh, certainly for a significant initial period, by somebody very junior and inexperienced. And thankfully that's changing and changing for the better. There are some negatives which I think it's important to address because uh, the public need to understand why some of the changes that are going to take place over time need to take place. The practice of ambulance services bringing victims to the nearest hospital has been very slow to end in this country, even if that means victims and particularly multiple victims been brought to departments or facilities that don't have the resources or infrastructure to treat them. We have too many emergency departments and some really not worthy of the name. They have signposts uh, and they may have uh, documentation that suggests that they're an emergency department, but they neither have the staff nor the infrastructure to actually provide the level of care that's appropriate 2011. As you're well aware, I mean, the public are, are well aware of this issue, but emergency departments are currently uh, 
full of admitted inpatients who should be in hospital beds. And they really, that, that issue needs to be addressed so that emergency departments can do what they're there to do and do what they're capable of doing and what they would do well if, if they were freed up to be able to do that. The point Anya made is very well made. If you come to a hospital somewhere outside the greater Dublin region and you have problems that require you to be sent to national centres and if you have more than one problem, the difficulty is we have to, in theory, send a bit of you to one place and a bit of you somewhere else because there is no single hospital. The nearest we have is Cork University Hospital but in general we have no hospital that can cope with a generality. So if you have a head injury and a spinal injury, the head injury services in Beaumont, the spinal injury services in the matter, and so on. And I can give you multiple examples of that. And as a country, we need to face up to that and sort it out. So let's move on and talk about the, really the meat of the, the subject, what, what I wanted to talk about, and that's the rationale and treatment priorities for how we manage road victims. This is something that people need to understand and appreciate. You'll see this is, this is what's called a trimodal distribution of deaths. And you'll see that there are three peaks on this graph. There's the uh, left-hand red peak, which is the immediate deaths. These are, unfortunately, victims who neither the pre-hospital services nor the hospital services can do anything for. They have usually high spinal cord injuries, catastrophic brain injuries, or they have rupture of some of the main blood vessels in the chest. The second group, the so-called early deaths, these are people who die typically two to four hours after trauma. This is where good quality pre-hospital and hospital care can make a difference. And the third peak of deaths, those that die some weeks down the line, as the purple um, graph on the right-hand side, these are patients who die of either sepsis, either of infection, or multiple organ failure, usually in an intensive care unit, usually some weeks down the line. Again, good quality initial resuscitation, be it at the scene or be it in the emergency department, is going to positively affect that group. So this trimodal distribution of deaths was described by Trunkey in the 1980s. Now the relationship of 50, they're roughly 50%, 30% and 20%, that probably better describes the US experience where they have more, and this is obviously all trauma, not just road trauma, where they have more penetrating trauma. But the principle is important to understand. So all we can do about the first phase is stop it happening by prevention. Medical services can have no impact on this. But the efficacy of pre and in hospital care will significantly affect the second and third peaks. And that's where our focus as healthcare professionals needs to be. Now the golden hour is the, the title I was given, but the golden hour to some extent has come and gone because it was misunderstood by people to mean something that it wasn't intended to be. It was never written up as a paper as such, but it was described by R. Adams Cowley who went on to, to set up the shock trauma centre in Baltimore, Maryland in the early 1960s. Now, Cowley had been a military surgeon in his previous incarnation, and he based some of what he said on the French World War I military experience. And that was that if you got to a casualty and started treatment within an hour, they had a much better chance of survival than if it was two hours or three hours or whatever. And in many ways, that stands to reason. That's an, almost a statement of the obvious. But it really isn't the full story. And, and, and it's now used, the term is now used, the golden hour as a concept, to describe a sense of urgency rather than a strict period of an hour. So our view of it in 2011 is that, yes, we do need to recognize that time is of the essence. But some conditions will not last for an hour. So, as those of you who were here when Garrett spoke this morning about his lucky experience of having an intensive care nurse pass the scene of his motor vehicle collision and unobstruct his airway, he would probably have died in five minutes of an obstructed airway. So, although we talk about the golden hour, there are many conditions that can't last an hour and can only last for minutes. Some, on the other hand, can last for longer. And the type of things 
that do require rapid intervention are, for example, the obstructed airway that he spoke about, or a condition which medics will be familiar with, of attention pneumothorax, where basically you get air in the pleural space between the uh, lung and the chest wall, which causes the lung to collapse, but not alone that, but it forces the midline structures over to the opposite side and basically blocks your circulation and kills you. And that's called a tension pneumothorax. So in many ways, because you know, we can't have a hospital everywhere, and the concept of a hospital at every crossroads is certainly not going to be a future idea, but the focus has to be on bringing the hospital to the patient, and that's why there has been such significant upskilling and resourcing of the emergency medical services. It's important also to have some perspective on you know, what goes wrong and what, you know, what are the things that cause preventable death. And there was a landmark study from the UK, which was published as long ago as 1988. But what it showed was there were two major causes of preventable death following trauma. And these are hypoxia, which means a shortage of oxygen, or hypovolemia, which means volume loss, and in this situation we're usually talking about blood loss. Now that can be due to a failure or a delay in detection that you have a problem, the decision to treat, or the actual delivery of that treatment. But that sort of detailed information underpins what we do, so it underpins the approach of both the emergency medical services, which you saw the demonstration of earlier, and emergency departments. Now, the resuscitation approach that we use in practice is one that's come from the American experience with some slight modifications for our practice, and that's the Advanced Trauma Life Support course. And the pre-hospital practitioners use the pre-hospital trauma life support, which is, if you like, a, a half-brother of this. What was revolutionary about this was that the standard model of medical care up to now, if you ever go to an outpatient clinic, you'll be asked what your problem is, and then you'll be go through a series of questions, and those questions are structured. And then when you get to the end of that, somebody will decide to do some tests. And when you get to the end of that, somebody will make a, a presumptive diagnosis, and then they will try and work out what, what bit they do in what order. So what's revolutionary about this approach, and which is the approach that emergency departments will take, is we set about treating the greatest threat to life first. Um, and that's prioritized using the ABC approach, which I'll talk about in a moment. It's also important to recognize you don't need a definitive diagnosis to start many of the treatments. You don't need to necessarily know which organ is damaged in the abdomen to decide somebody needs a laparotomy to open their abdomen to surgically save their life. It also reinforces the principle of time being of the essence and at all stages do no further harm. And unfortunately there are examples of harm having been done in the past because of the interventions that took place. I only have one relatively gory slide, but the problem was this is an open dislocation of the ankle. And 20 years ago if you came into a hospital in Ireland, I can guarantee you that the, the people treating you would have gone and dived in to try and deal with this. Whereas now, they won't ignore this, but they will start with the higher priority issues. And they will start by making sure your airway is patent and working their way sequentially through it until this becomes an issue. Nobody is going to die in the short term from this. But they die of less obvious or less apparently obvious conditions. So the treatment priorities, people often oversimplify this and think that just because you can put it in an alphabetical sequence that it must be just simplification for the sake of simplification, it isn't. The first treatment priority is to sort out somebody's airway. And I'll talk about how you do that in a moment. Then sort out their breathing and ventilation. That means ensure that they're adequately oxygenated. Third element is the circulation, and if they have a source of bleeding, to stop that. There is a bit of alphabetical contrivance when you get on to D and E. D is essentially a neurological assessment, and E is this paradox of exposure and environment control. So on the one hand, you want to be able to examine the entire patient, but on the other hand, you don't want the patient to become cold because hypothermia is bad for people. But this is not just about simplistic alphabetical sequencing. This is the order of lethality. 
you will die more quickly from an obstructed airway, which is an A problem, than you'll die from a tension pneumothorax, which I mentioned earlier, which is a B problem, than you will from a ruptured spleen, which is a C problem, than you will from the head injury of the kind that only showed earlier on the CT scan, which is a D problem. So the approach of an emergency department, therefore, is to resuscitate and stabilize you, address your life-threatening injuries, and if they can't do it, get somebody who can, for example, it may require surgical intervention. Try and delineate the injuries, and that means that we use CT scanning far more than we would have in the past, because we need to be able to work out where this patient is ultimately needing to go to. No patient is going to have their definitive care or their long-term inpatient care in an emergency department they're going to have to be transferred somewhere, whether it be in that hospital or elsewhere. So everybody is going to have a transfer, be it to an operating theatre, an intensive care unit, or a ward, or they may require to be transferred to specialised regional and national centres if specific expertise is required, but only after they've been stabilised. And examples of that are burns, and you do get burns, sadly, in motor vehicle collisions, cars can go on fire. Neurosurgery, uh, which takes place in Beaumont or in Cork, or cardiothoracic surgery, which takes place in the Matter, Cork, um, to a lesser extent, Galway and James's. So let's talk a little bit about the resuscitation. Now, your airway, at its most simple, people can get into long-winded discussions about what constitutes your airway, but at its most simple, it's basically a tube. And it's a tube to convey air from the outside to, to your lungs where gas exchange can take place. So as it's a tube, what our approach is to do is to assess whether that tube is patent or not, whether it's open, and if it's not open, make it open. And that usually means that we end up securing somebody's airway by intubating them, which means putting a plastic tube you know, down into their airway and therefore taking, um, making it safer and taking control of the situation. But during that process, we need to ensure that the cervical spine and the spine in general is stabilized and protected because uh, a spinal injury, as you have seen from the pictures earlier, is catastrophic. Now, all trauma victims need high concentrations of supplemental oxygen. It's one of those truisms. And if they're not breathing adequately, and we determine that either because their rate is too fast or too slow, or the volume of air that they're moving is inadequate, then we need to take over their, their breathing, and that means intubating them and mechanically ventilating them. And that sometimes brings up this question of when you hear, you know, somebody's on a life support machine. That's not always the end of the world. It's always as a means of doing better for them than they can do for themselves, although sometimes it's seen because of when it happens and what ultimately happens to the patient as to be the beginning of the end. In the case of the circulation, we obviously need to assess the circulation. If there's any obvious source of bleeding, then we need to address that. And that may be something as simple as a pressure dressing or a splint, for example, in a deformed fracture. We need to restore their volume loss. So if people have lost blood, we need to get volume into them. And that means early use of blood. There's no point in giving somebody large volumes of clear fluid that don't have oxygen carrying capacity because only blood has oxygen carrying capacity. Now, there are some exceptions to that in the case of penetrating torso trauma. And we may need to stop the bleeding surgically. Now, this is a bat, okay, it's a very um, antique-looking bat. But it's a useful analogy to understand when we're talking about managing the circulation. If you want to have a bat, assuming the water is warm, you can turn on the taps for as long as you want and as high volume is the one, but if you don't put the stopper in, you'll never fill your bath. And this is where things can go wrong, is that sometimes you need an operation to stop the cause of the bleeding rather than simply replace large volumes of blood and keep trying to chase blood loss that you can't catch up with. But throughout the whole process, we need to bear in mind the mechanism of injury, and that's why the information that we get from the pre-hospital care people is important. You know, if we, if we know the exact nature of the impact, we have a better chance of guessing, not so much guessing, but anticipating what the injuries are likely to be, and therefore not missing things. And through at all stages, we need to protect the patient from further harm, and that basically means spinal protection, 
and protection from hypothermia. And bear in mind that if we're giving somebody oxygen and fluids, there is the risk that they're going to be cold and they're going to contribute to reducing the temperature, so we have to address that. And at all stages, most people who work in emergency medicine have a healthy sense of paranoia. And that's because there are missed injuries that in certain circumstances, junior or inexperienced people may well miss, which is the advantage of senior people being involved in trauma care. They at least will have seen it before. They'll know with a certain pattern of injury, then you're likely to have other injuries which may be difficult to diagnose. And if you're unconscious, for example, it may be very difficult to diagnose some of these injuries. Nerve or vessel, nerve or blood vessel injuries may be very difficult to diagnose somebody who's unconscious and therefore you can't test in the way that you would test somebody who's fully conscious. So in summary, the management of major trauma in the emergency department and unfortunately, and it still is the case, that the majority of the major trauma we see comes from road traffic collisions I too am from the school that doesn't believe that calling them road traffic accidents is appropriate. It's now structured and protocol driven. It's based on well-established international principles and treatment priorities, but needs to be enhanced by adequate timely access to tertiary care in national centres. There's no point in having a wonderful resuscitation in the emergency department in the hospital and then not being able to, to be transferred or go in a timely fashion to where the next level of care needs to be provided for the particular problem that an individual patient has. Thanks very much.